get that. I know you get that. You have three kids that, <laughs> what, what, what? Or even when you say what, they're still telling your name. Like you have to actually acknowledge them, daddy, daddy. And I'm like, and I'm looking, daddy, daddy. I'm looking at you. What? <laughs> I hear I'm, you. I'm to say what I'm you want. I'm standing next to you. I'm holding your hand. I'm holding you in the air. What, what do you want? <laughs> What up, everybody? Welcome to Corona Season Episode 3 with Justin Sarachik. We have this awesome gentleman here. I've been following him for a minute. He's hiding under his purple hoodie. Maybe it'll show a blue. Who knows? Um, <laughs> man of God, husband, father, father of two, um, as well as the editor-in-chief of Rapzilla and an all-around entrepreneur. What up, Justin? Thank you so much for joining me. Yo, 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 what up? This is, this, yeah, for everyone watching, this is a blue hoodie. It, for whatever reason, looks purple. I tried to use a better piece of technology to record this interview, and it didn't work. So we're just on a plain old laptop computer that makes me look royal. But I'm super excited to join Phoenix with an F. That's right. On this Corona season podcast. Um, this is uh, the second time today that I never, I never get to be interviewed for, for anybody. I'm always interviewing people all the time. Um, yes, you this are. is actually the second podcast that I was invited to be on today. Oh, so, nice. So Corona season is kind of like people want to talk to me uh, about me for some reason. But um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have the cure, everybody. I'm just, I'm just the guy. I'm just the guy here. You don't got the answer, Sway? Sway, you don't got the answers. I, I do not. I do not have, contrary to popular belief, in New York City, where I live, the epicenter of coronavirus, I, I do not have the answers. That's so okay. So let's get let's get into that really quick. So I was okay. gonna ask you your exact location in New York. And also just so you know, I'm representing on behalf of you, the Jets. You're probably not even a Jets fan, I don't know. I don't and, know uh, like football. Okay, but, the word, word up. We'll just take the New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a baseball, basketball guy. Um, Here we go. Unfortunately, the Knicks and unfortunately, the Mets. So I, I chose the wrong teams. Um, but I stay true to orange and blue. But Right or die. Yeah, so, so I'm in Staten Island, New York. If you don't know what that is, it is the forgotten of the five boroughs uh, of New York City. Bronx, Queens, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Staten Island. Um, the Wu-Tang Clan is from here. That's probably Shaolin. our name. Shaolin. And also, we have, like, the world's biggest garbage dump. Um, so we have that going for us as well. So the home of Wu-Tang and smells. <laughs> yes. I did not uh, know that. I, I knew about so Wu-Tang, but I didn't know about the trash. That's awesome. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that's, um, that's what we do. <laughs> so, so I was going to ask you really quick, do you, wanna, do you mind plugging that other podcast, or do they want you to keep it top secret? Uh, all right. Well, this is going to, it's going to sound like a bit of a flex, um, yeah. but <laughs> I was on the Fern from Social Club's new podcast. Oh, nice. Um, I don't know why he wanted to talk to me. I tweeted at him yesterday um, saying, hey, I had a dream that I was eating tacos with Social Club and Fern <laughs> didn't like the guacamole. And he answered back and says, I love guac. He said, P.S. I love guac. But the first thing he said was, yo, DM me. I want to get you on my podcast. P.S. I love guac. I feel and like. I, so, yeah. So I hit him up and he's like, yeah, I want you on my podcast. He goes, I want to interview the interviewer. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and then he's going to be on my podcast next week. And then there we go. I'm doing this one today. So uh, there you go. So that's, that's exciting. Not out yet. I don't know when it's coming out, but. Word, I'll word. let the family of this podcast know. Nice, nice. So I feel like uh, that was a missed opportunity on his behalf. Come on, Fern. I know you don't know me, but I respect you as an MC. You should have been like, I love guac, let's talk, and then left it there. <laughs> yeah. Or like, well, what I said to him is he didn't like the guac at the taco spot. So like, <laughs> it kept that like syllable uh, rhyme scheme going. There it was. There it was. <laughs> Speaking of, did you see Dayton's challenge that he's doing right now? Yes. And I think I'm going to, I'm going to pull pull out and dust off the mic and hit him with something. 
Uh, yeah, you should do that. Definitely. Definitely. You should do that. I will I got, like it and I will share I it. <laughs> I, got, I got, I got some, I entered his last one, but he didn't see it. And I entered one for KJ five, two, a couple oh, years nice. ago. And, uh, he liked it. He didn't choose it, but he liked it. <laughs> respect, respect. All right, man, let's get into this list really quick. So let's just starting it. out. Um, so I got some questions specifically around Corona, but also just wanted to kind of talk to you a little more. Because that is the focus, but it's not the focus, but it is the focus. You know what I mean? Like we're in the midst of this, but also we're still living. Um, so right. man of God. So how long have you known? Tell us a little testimony about your relationship with Jesus. Okay. I don't have anything like exciting, any like uh, any Saul to Paul sort of story. Uh, I've been in church probably since I'm three years old. My uncle had a church in Queens. Uh, he was a pastor. I believe he was only 19 or 20 years old when he started the church. Uh, I come from a huge Puerto Rican family. So uh, despite my Sarachik last name, I'm actually quite Puerto Rican. And um, uh, so he had like a Puerto Rican church in, in Queens. Um, and then I guess I would say I became a Christian when I was five, watching a VHS tape of a Carmen concert. Uh, so <laughs> for, for anybody, for anybody probably older than, uh, 25 you'll know about this but anyone under that carmen was uh a, quite a special man in christian music i thought you were um, gonna say for anybody under, over 25 you'll know what a vhs is yeah that that, <laughs> that too uh, i don't know dude was a, a pioneer in christian music a, a lot of it does not hold up well now when he was rapping as like a 40 year old uh you know italian white dude in yeah, 1993, bars in 1993 those who's in the house bars but um, but yeah. Nevertheless, that's that's where it was. And then I grew up in uh, in the church. You know, did the whole youth group thing. Was a youth leader for a while. Um, and then eventually, not not necessarily by choice. Like I, I studied journalism when I when I went to college, and then wound up pretty much exclusively being in the Christian media world uh, from my first job till now, just covering uh, Christian entertainment and music, which is fitting because I've just seen it my whole life. Um, like just in the church, listening to music in youth group, watching Carmen when I was five, uh, you know, Veggie Tales, like anything that you grew up on as, as a Christian or people make memes and stuff, like that was part of my life. And now I get to like write about these things. Um, yeah, so just pretty much in church as, as long as I can remember. Um, and a lot of my Puerto Rican family are, are Christians, my aunts, um, you know, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, my, my mom, uh, then eventually my dad. Um, so yeah. Oliqua, you speak Spanish? Oliqua, no, I do not. I, I understand it pretty decently. Uh, everybody, all my aunts, my mom, my grandmother, my grandparents from Puerto Rico, they all speak it, but my dad is not Puerto Rican. Um, so my mom did not teach me Spanish because there was no one to speak to you know in the house my right, right right and my mom was born here so it's not like um english is her second language it's you know they're equal so nice. i missed out so with uh the last name what is what is that do you know what culture yeah, where that comes so, from so um i they probably like two or three generations down my father's family came from poland like a polish it's like polish russian jewish sort of <coughs> sort of mix um, that side of my family is not like super cultural though. They're more mm -hmm. just Americanized with a Jewish background. Um, so I really only found a lot of information out when I, I did like the DNA test. And then I saw it was like Ashkenazi Jewish, which basically means anywhere from Europe, they just traveled. And that was like a mixture of everybody, you know, on my dad's side of the family, uh, while, you know, my mother could be traced, you know, down to Puerto Rico and then over the boat to like Spain, France, Africa, you know, everywhere where Puerto Ricans come from, which is everywhere. <laughs> right, right. So where did, uh, well, let me ask you this. What, what DNA test did you take? This is not a plug. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting no money for this. Um, I took the, was it the, the ancestry one? I think I took. Okay. 
we just did that. I'm, I'm curious to find out. Look, I know I'm me- mainly Mexican American. Uh, I don't speak Spanish either. Uh, my mom's from Mexico. My dad, he's born in Cali. Uh, they both speak Spanish and I don't, I don't blame them anymore because I'm an adult. <laughs> so I need to pick it up on my own. You know what I mean? But like when I was younger, I was like, why didn't you guys teach me Spanish? Yeah, I, I, that's, that's a skill. That's a helpful skill. Oh, definitely. Like, you know, I wanted to be the the person who was like, hey, we have this person online. We have no idea what they're saying. Or somebody showed up to, I used to be a busboy or a waiter. It's like, hey, maybe you have someone here who doesn't speak English. Oh, I got this. I got this. Right, and I right. take that tip for the Spanish speaking table. And they'll look at me and they'll be like, I might be able to get a couple words. And then I'm like, all right, slow down, slow down. <laughs> it's poquito. I think they want water. I think they want water. <laughs> nice, nice. That's awesome. All right, so... Uh, the next question is, so how long have you been married? And tell us how you guys met, if you don't mind sharing that. Sure. Uh, so I've been married since 2013, um, which I was, what, 24, 25 years old when I got married. Uh, I met my wife in 2008. Um, actually, re-met her in 2008. We, we actually went to school together when we were really young. She's a, she was in a grade above mine, um, and we went to a small Christian school. So like when I was in fourth, I was in the school for fourth and fifth grade. So then she was in fifth and sixth grade. And I actually remembered her because um, she's best friends with a family that I'm very good friends with. And we just never really crossed paths over the years. So when I met her through these friends, I was like, oh, I know you. And she's like, I have no idea who you are. (laughs) Seemingly the story of my life for a lot of things. So we basically met again for the first time in, uh, in 2008. Um, and then we started dating almost, you know, a couple of weeks later and, uh, yeah, got married in 2013 and we have two kids now. Nice. And how, how old are your kids? If you don't mind sharing. Yeah. So my son is seven months old. His big milestone today was his tooth came all the way through his first tooth. Oh. And, uh, my daughter is three. Um, she just turned three a couple months ago and her big milestone is, um, stop peeing in the bed. So, I mean, we're, we're living large on this quarantine right now. No, man, that's huge. That's huge. <laughs> that's huge. My baby boy, he just started like, uh, he keeps telling us he wants to go potty. And so he sits on the toilet and he shoots the deuce. And I'm just like, all right, I'm gonna take that. I'm gonna take that as a win. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're proud The the things that you're proud of as a parent, like these milestones, like you know, it's like when you got the older kids are like, yeah, you know, my, my son hit a walk off home run today or, you know, my, you know, they got a goal or we got straight A's and I'm like, yo, they didn't pee, didn't pee on themselves today. Right. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a sticker and a high five. Oh yeah. That's beautiful. And she sleeps in my bed. So when she peed in the bed, she was peeing in my bed that I was sleeping in with <laughs> next to her. <laughs> that's the best, man. <laughs> yep. That's Waking awesome. up at three in the morning. Oh, here we go again. Everybody's <laughs> soaked. <laughs> uh, I got some stories like that too. Um, so I was going to ask you. So with your with your seven month old has is a boy, right? Boy. Uh, yes. Um, is he been has he been teething like crazy then, or has it been not too bad? I mean, he's been putting stuff in his mouth all the time. So I I would assume he's just always been teething since he came out. <laughs> But like, like everything's going in his mouth, but now, like, especially like, like I could just have my hand and he'll just go oh. Oh, right, right into his mouth. And I'm like, oh man, okay. But yeah, he's got the little tooth that just came out on the bottom. So now like it's game over, like anything, if he could chew on air, he would be chewing on air right now. <laughs> That's awesome. I got two kids like that. The other one wasn't like that. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> So you're the editor in chief of Rapzilla. Yes. Tell us your, how did, how did that come about? Like, what's your story to that point? Um, let's start with, uh, Chris, what was it? Christian media, uh, Christian post, Christian post, start from leaving from there and then kind of your journey to Rapzilla and how that okay, happened. Okay. So after Christian post. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I'll give you a little bit before cause that okay. has to do with it, but so right out of college, I was very fortunate, like journalism is a really tough industry. And I know many of the people that I graduated college with in 2011, either took them like five years to get a journalism job, or they just never did it. And I would say almost, why is it tough? 
Uh, it's super competitive. Okay. Um, it doesn't pay very well, especially when you start out. Um, and like we live in a, a society now where like journalism can be done by anybody anywhere and that could be okay. Like I always use this example, <laughs> <laughs> like a fire could be happening on somebody's house and there's a 10 year old kid walking by and he pulls out his camera and goes on Facebook live. And now he just reported the fire. This 10 year old right. kid on his bike is like, Hey, breaking story. There's a fire in my neighborhood. The media is not there. The police aren't there. The fire department, nobody. That's a breaking story. Now his video goes viral and it's like, what do you do? I, I just, I'm going home to play Fortnite. Like, so like, why would somebody pay me to do that? And also you can get your news for free everywhere. You know, nobody's buying newspapers. Oh, um, I, I really don't know anybody who pays for a subscription to a website to read news. I don't do it. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, it's tough. There's not, there's not a lot of money in it and, you know, hiring, uh, the local newspaper in Staten Island where I live, like when I, I interned there for six months, um, mm -hmm. and they were in the process of like downsizing. And I even said to them, I was like, what are the uh, like realistic possibilities of me getting a job here after my internship? And it was basically like, well, someone has to quit or die basically <laughs> for, there, <laughs> for there to be an opening. Um, so I was like, okay, helpful. So so I, I graduated in, in spring of 2011 right. and uh, someone from my church actually sent me a message and I really didn't ever talk to this guy at the time. Now he's one of my you know best friends. He's like, hey, I just started working. I know you, you study journalism. I just started working at this Christian company uh, in Manhattan. They just started. Do um, you want to come work here? Uh, he's like, they're hiring. And I was like, wow, I literally, you know, I graduated four months prior. I worked at, a, I graduated college. And then I delivered pizzas and worked at a summer camp as a science teacher. They had an opening. I took it. I did not really pass science at all anywhere, uh, but it was better than delivering pizza. Uh, summer camp was winding down. And so I, I went and I applied and uh, I got the job. So it was, so it was cool. So I got that journal about the pay was abysmal and embarrassingly low, but you know, you take what you can get when you get out of college. It was a foot in the door. Um, so I basically was really close to getting fired because I wasn't getting the right amount of hits that they needed for the articles, but I guess they liked me. So they're like, well, this journalism side's not working out. So we're going to move you to a video, uh, a video company that we just started that we're beta testing. And we want you to just help us make a Christian version of YouTube, which is just like, all right. I mean, there's already a YouTube. Why do we need a Christian version of it? But I was like, I want a job. So, <laughs> so for almost two years, basically, I found videos on YouTube that were Christian. And then I just downloaded them and I put them on this other website called Gmail. <laughs> it, was the, it was such a, a terrible job because it was so boring. I'm not oh, writing or interviewing people. So I basically started all these side hustles while I was doing that because the job was so easy and like, um, I guess, brain melting. So I wound up like starting a local music label. I had like a, a music magazine. I was, I was rapping. I was doing stuff with the band. I was like making all these amazing moves, but like from my desk at work because the job was so easy. Um, and then, and then it kind of turned around where I was able to get an interview um, with Scott Stapp, the singer of Creed. Um, because I, I had a music magazine and we had him for the magazine and he's right, a Christian. Right, right. So I was like, Hey, I can get like Scott Stapp, who's a super famous guy in here to the Christian post. They're like, Oh, but you're not a journalist right now. And I was like, no, no, no. I I'm a journalist. You guys just aren't utilizing that. So, so when I got him in, I wound up doing like this video interview with him. Meanwhile, all I've been doing is uploading videos for like two years. And they saw that and they're like, oh, like you're good at this. I was like, yeah, I, I know. Like you just didn't appreciate what you had. Uh, moved back to, to uh, doing journalism. Like they moved me back to there. And then I started killing it. And I started writing about like trends, mostly video games. Um, yeah, I was at the time PS4 and Xbox One were coming out. So I started writing about that. I started writing about Pokemon X and Y and Super Smash Brothers. Like my hits were going crazy. I was getting like millions of uh, readers a month. 
um, just for my articles alone. And I kept doing that and I was getting all these crazy bonuses. So then, so then they were just like, all right, you're really good. Um, so now we're going to move you to another website. And I'm like, oh, great. Here we go. <laughs> and we just bought this website called breathecast.com. And we want it to be like the MTV version of Christian Post. I was like, yes. I was like, this is exactly what I want. So they made me an assistant editor of this website that was basically getting 300 views a month. Like it was a dead website. And they gave me and they gave me a team of like two other people. And they said, all right, make this the coolest website in Christian entertainment. And uh, over the next year and a half, I, I think we really were. We had all these people. We had a, a studio. Um, we had a weekly show. Uh, I was doing maybe five or six interviews a week from everybody all over Christian music, from rock to hip hop, pop, CCM, worship. And a lot of those people would even come into the studio. So like we had Lecrae, we had KB, we had Tadashi, we had Triple E, we had Skillet, we had Flyleaf, uh, we had Chris Tomlin, um, uh, Carrie Job, Natalie Grant, like all these huge stars of, of Christian music they all, and then uh you know so i was finally like getting paid like a human salary doing <laughs> doing my dream job and then one day like it was just you know bad things were happening there and then one day they were just like yeah uh we're closing the new york office uh we're laying everybody off and uh that's it so wow. like wow. october of 2015 and like that's it now i was out of a job um I had like one month's worth of severance pay. My wife luckily uh, works for New York State, so she had a good job. Uh, so I was home and I was like, all right, what do I do? Because the journalism industry, like I said, is so um, kind of cutthroat and so hard. And I was applying, applying, and I was getting nowhere. Um, so that's when I hit up um, Chad Horton, owner of Rapzilla. <laughs> and at the time, the other co-owner, no longer anymore, but Phil Rood, who founded Rapzilla. And I was like, hey, I had met Chad Horton like maybe a couple of years prior. He actually came to Christian Post to talk about hip hop. Um, so I met him, but I never like spoke to him really. And I knew what Rapzilla was, uh, but he go, uh, but I was like, Hey, do you guys offer any paid freelancing spots? And they were like, no, <laughs> and I was like, okay. He's like, but make us an offer. Cause we know who you are. And I was like, all right. So I did. And I made a very low ball offer because I was desperate. And uh, they took it because why wouldn't they? Because uh, it was a really bad offer. It was really bad negotiating tactics on my behalf. Um, but I needed something. Can you, had, can you, can you, uh, can you elaborate on that? Can you say what you learned from that for people who are listening who are maybe, and I'm, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but like valuing ourselves and then taking that value that we have for ourselves and actually putting it out there what would you say? yeah so I was just kind of seeing where they were at and like what they were doing I was like what do I think like they'll be able to afford while also saying like I know I can they'll definitely say yes if I give them this number right so like the number I worked at was like ten dollars an article which is actually extraordinarily terrible but for me I know from from my years of being like hustling at the Christian post where it was like, um, you need a certain amount of hits to basically survive and keep your job. I was writing at some points, 10 to 15 articles a day. Mm -hmm. um, were they great articles? No, but they were, I was able to get a lot of clicks with them. So I was writing anywhere from 10 to 15 articles a day. So I was like, I know if I can write like 10 articles for them at $10 a pop, I mean, that's, that's good. It's a bill. Yeah. Um, except that when I took that, like they only had like a couple of articles a week for me. And some of these articles, like one of the first article they gave me, it took me like two hours to do. And I was like, all right, well, that wasn't worth $10 at all. I was like, that was terrible. Like that was really bad. It's like five uh, bucks an hour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I had, you know, and I had some other uh, freelance like prospects at the time that I was doing. And, you know, so I had money coming in, uh, but eventually you know, I, I did well and it was like, Hey, can I become part of the team? So then, so then I started working part-time like 20 hours a week. And then from there it was like 30 hours a week. And then we actually had lost the writer. Um, and then Phil had left and it was like, they really needed somebody to step up. 
Uh, so I was like, yo, let me be the guy and pay me to do kind of folk. I'm not like 40 hours a week, but I'm like 35 hours a week, but that's give and take. Sometimes it might be 45 hours a week, mm-hmm. but I'm generally like, you know, in that 35 hour a week window um, where, you know, I'm doing it. And sometimes that's like, you know, I got to pop in on a Saturday or I can't take a vacation because like I'm in charge. So like when I, when I take a vacation, uh, you know, my wife goes to sleep in the hotel or wherever we're at. And then I got to pop on my laptop and just check emails, make sure everything's going. Like it never, it never stops. I never get that vacation except when my children were born, like those couple of days I was in the hospital, that was like my vacation from work <laughs> of not being in charge of anything. Um, so yeah, editor in chief, it's like, wow, that's such a cool title, but you know, it's, it's a lot of work because you're, you're helping steer the ship, you're helping run the ship. Um, but I have no complaints because I have a blast. Um, and you know, I get to talk to a lot of awesome people and make connections like this and, and yeah, I mean, it's a lot of fun. So I do that. Uh, Rapzilla is the main gig. I do some playlisting. I work with independent artists, you know, I do press releases and bios and consultation. I work at Phoenix Studios. So the place that I film the Rapzilla show at, I do some promotion and show production mm-hmm. for them there. Um, yeah, so I'm just kind of all over the place. So that's, so how do, that's, that's basically it wrapped up. <laughs> <It's> a nice <laughs> a little, lot. nice little package. Um, so how did, how did the, uh, where did the idea for doing the weekly update or weekly kind of what's going on to CHH come from? Yeah. So we actually, believe it or not, um, one day, uh, uh, the rapper on reach records, she, <laughs> she used to intern for Rapzilla. And that was something she did um, kind of, I guess, bi-weekly. And we, since she left, we never, we never had that. And I started working at Phoenix Studios and, and um, you know, they have this, this recording studio there and we were looking for shows. You know, we had a couple of shows and podcast filming there. Uh, so I was like, hey, why don't I just connect us together, uh, Phoenix Studios with Rapzilla. We do a Rapzilla show there. And then, you know, we could kind of split and, and, you know, do any like ad revenue or, you know, just whatever. So I I created that partnership and I've been doing the Rapzilla show. It's, it's coming on a year actually. And, you know, every month or so we leveled it up and it's, it's like, if you look at those first episodes and especially the audio and the video, it wasn't as good, but as we kept going, you know, we added that, added a little more like production value and, but now with this thing, I'm actually doing it from my office bedroom in my house. So on my phone, I'm filming it from my phone and uh, I'm, I'm editing an iMovie. And so that's been interesting the last two weeks. <laughs> right. You're watching those YouTube tutorials. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, yeah. I've always known a, a little bit about video editing and stuff, but, um, you know, having a studio and having a team do it for you is so much different than I got to set everything up by myself. Like last week I recorded the video and I set it up and I, I got the light I got everything perfect, the mic. And I sit down and I record the whole video and then I take my phone off and I realized that it only filmed me up to like right here. <laughs> so so I'm like, all right, well, here we go again. So then I got to <laughs> set it all back up, reset everything. And then, yeah. So those are the home challenges. I don't, I didn't have anybody. I thought I framed it good. Right. Uh, but I didn't have anybody to tell me that uh, it was recording my face. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for so the those confession. Are some of the challenges. It talks about and James confessing to one another. So thank you for doing that. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, you kind of touched on it. I'll come back around to one of those other ones, but um, so you kind of touched on it a little bit. You said like kind of in the situation we're in, I do it now at home. So how has, we'll just start there. How has, how has the coronavirus, COVID-19, how has it affected like your guys' like flow within Rapzilla? Um, it really hasn't affected our flow at all because we don't have an office. Like uh, Chad Horton, the owner, he lives in San Diego. I'm in New York. Uh, our other guy, Steven Solis, is in Maryland. And then we have a bunch of freelancers and contributors who live all over the country. So it's not like we ever commuted like I see Chad like once or twice a year. Um, so like I just was in the same room as him 
for the first time after working for Rabzilla for four years. Last year was like the first time we were in the same room together. Uh-huh. Um, besides that time that he came to the Christian Post in like 2013 or whenever it was when I didn't even know him. Um, so it's funny how we do it. We're, you know, we're always talking online and doing stuff, but you don't actually get to see your coworkers. So the only workflow that really changed for us is now there's a less things happening within the community because nobody's touring. Um, you know, the artist, the artist lives have changed a lot more. Um, so how we cover them and, and how much we're covering has changed. But at the same time, now that they're all home, they're all making music and like shooting videos and doing stuff. So then that's still providing us things that we can do. Um, other than that, like my actual work schedule has changed a lot. Normally, uh, and I was telling you this before we came on, normally I work like 10.30, 11 a.m. to about 4 o'clock, 4.30. And then uh, that's that's by the time my wife gets home from work and then we hang out, we have dinner, they go to bed and then I'll jump on at like 9 o'clock for like two more hours and then that's it. Like that's my day. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now she's got to work from home. Uh, her job isn't flexible. Like, you know, I create my hours. So she works from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. at home. But now with my parents not being able to come and my mother-in-law not being able to come because everyone's quarantined, now I have to watch the kids from the time they wake up until my wife is done with work. Um, but then we want to have our family time and we have dinner and we hang out. So now I'm starting work at 9 p.m. And then I work to like 3 or 4 in the morning. And then I'm up at like 7.30, 8 a.m. to watch the kids all day. So it's just very exhausting uh, times right now for me. So how was that? How was that? Because I know um, for me, when I'm physically tired, I'm a lot more shorter with my family than I should be. And God's always like, hey, watch yourself. Um, How has that affected you getting lack of sleep? Or are you the type of person that's like, you're good? Because I know there are people that are like, they don't need as much sleep. I don't yeah, know. like I'm used to not getting any sleep because, but most of the time it was my own doing of just, why didn't you go to sleep? Gosh, you know, I was doing stuff. Like, what what were you doing at three in the morning when you have work at like eight? You know, you always get procrastinating. Conquering the world. <laughs> yeah, you always procrastinate. I'm trying to start a record label that didn't <laughs> work, you know, st- stuff like that. Um, but now this is like sort of out of my control and kids are a whole different level. You know, when you're just home, at least, I mean, one of my kids doesn't talk, so it's not bad. But when you have a three-year-old, it's like, daddy, 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 all all day. And then you're trying to keep her away from my wife, who's trying to work amongst this chaos Mm -hmm. uh, on our dining room table. Um, Because she left my office to me. I don't know why, but... I was like, you can work in there. She's like, no, it's okay. I'll work on the dining room table. All right. In the middle of the chaos, uh, God bless. Um, so it's trying to keep my daughter away and then my son crying and you got to change diapers and then she wants to eat and she wants to play. Um, I'm pretty even keel, um, you know, very calm person generally. But yeah, like hearing that daddy like 7,000 times in a row and then you're dealing with one kid and it's just like my, my new response is not like it's not like yes my my new response is like what all the times what like that's that's basically how i respond um but yeah i'm trying not to uh i'm trying not to lose my cool uh but it could be definitely very easy to at this given time (laughs) i get that i know you get that you have three kids that (laughs) what 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 (laughs) or even when you say what they're still telling your name like you have to actually acknowledge them daddy daddy and i'm like and i'm looking daddy daddy i'm looking at you (laughs) i hear you i'm I'm standing next to you i'm holding your hand i'm holding you in the air what what do you want and then they're like look at me look at me i am looking at you what what do you want i want a snack you just had a snack i'm hungry you you're still eating like finish eating so it's it's stuff like that that just drives you crazy that's good that's good but it's it's fun stuff and i know like i don't take it for granted that i get to be like not necessarily that i'm stay at home dad but like i'm a work from home dad so i am a stay at home dad also so um regardless if there's people here like my parents or my mother-in-law helping out so that i can work 
my daughter could still come and knock on my door if she needs me. Mm -hmm. um, so I know there's plenty of people who commute and go to work and they miss out on their kids. So that's why in a way this is kind of a blessing for my wife because she went back to work uh, when my son was only four months old. And it's like, wow, that's, I'm leaving my baby at home. Like My yeah, baby yeah. needs me. And now she gets to be home for God knows how long. Um, and my son gets to have her here, you know, all day. Um, and that's, that's really cool. And they get to have both parents present at the same time, which I know is super important, especially when kids are young. Um, so yeah, I, you definitely don't take that for granted. So for all the, uh, that happens, um, it's definitely, you know, it's a good thing for sure. So you kind of hit on something right there. You're talking about like your perspective on it. So how important is perspective in this time? Would you say? Can you I think you kind of cut out? Okay. Can you hear me? Are you there? Hello, hello. <clears throat> hello, hello. Can you hear me? No, tell me I didn't lose him. Let's pause it for a second. All right, so just in that last little thing you're sharing, you were talking about, um, you didn't necessarily say it, but you were talking about your perspective on how the situation is going at home, how like you, you said it's a blessing. Right. How important is perspective in this time, do you think? Yeah, I mean, perspective is crazy. Like, I mean, for me, I, you know, I really have it easy. I know that there's a lot of people out there right now that lost their jobs or they can't work from home or they're trying to figure out what to do with their kids who are in school who aren't and maybe they're an essential, you know, worker or they're a nurse or a firefighter EMT, like someone who's got to be out there mm -hmm. or they have a, a sick family member or, you know, like we're, we're all at home. We're, you know, my wife and I are still working. Our kids aren't missing school because they're, they're, you know, babies basically. Um, so really nothing in our lives has, has changed except that my wife is here during the day right? Uh, because I was already here. My kids are already here. Um, yeah. And so that's the perspective that I have that I could say that this is a blessing and like my heart really goes out to kind of anybody who's just like, you know, we can't make it work. Um, and even with Rabzilla, like Rabzilla still functions normally. Like we still all are all working and doing what we have to do. Um, right. So my perspective has to be one of like, I have no complaints, you know, and I have to, you know, I can't complain that I'm going to bed at 4.30 in the morning or five in the morning, sometimes not even falling asleep. It's like, oh man, I can't believe this. I, I didn't get any sleep and now I have to watch my kids all day and then I have to go to work. It's like, no, nah, man, you, you're at home with your kids. You aren't sick. And then you also have a job. So like, that's the kind of the perspective that I have to keep in mind that I'm just like, okay, definitely blessed. And at least if I'm going to be, you know, trapped in a house with somebody, you know, it's with the, the three most important people uh, in my life to me. Um, so that's kind of the perspective that I, that I hold. Nice. It's beautiful. Um, so with that, uh, do you guys know anybody direct directly who's been, um, who's caught, who's caught yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, there's a, uh, a man in my church who has it. And then subsequently, um, his wife and his, his kids got it. Um, and he's had it for about eight days now. Um, I know, you know, I know a couple of nurses um, that they don't have it, but, you know, they're, they're on the front lines of it every day. Right. Um, one of my friends, his, um, his, his friend, one of his best friends had cancer. And because he was, you know, battling cancer, he got coronavirus. And it was like within two days he was gone. Wow. So like. I don't know anybody like in my immediate family or like that I would say that I'm like really, really friends with where it's like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe this person has it. Right. But like adjacent to people I know, uh, yeah, definitely, you know, it's, it's affected some people that I know. So that family that, you know, um, how are they doing? Are they getting better? Are they kind of the same? Are they getting worse? Uh, 
Yeah, I, I think so. The, the, the father, the husband has had it for eight days already. Um, and he's just like tons of fevers and going back and forth. And I think like the other ones are progressively getting worse. I don't really know uh, their, their full situation, but none of them are hospitalized. Um, so that's, that's good, I guess. Uh, oh, and actually uh, a family friend, her daughter had it and she didn't know. And she was just at home really sick for like a week. And she's like, what's going on? And then she finally went to the hospital and they were like, oh, you have it, you know, but they sent her back home. Um, so I guess as long as you're sent home and you're not stuck in a hospital, like you're doing okay. Um, but yeah. But I'm sure at another week passes or so, another two weeks, it's going to be people I know, you know, unfortunately, people I know or, or family members or whoever, because I feel like like on Staten Island, especially, well, I guess New York City in general, it's like every 24 hours, you look at the numbers and it's like up like another four or five hundred. Um, and the rest of New York City is like highly populated. So, you know, Manhattan has a couple million people, Brooklyn like, you know, two, four million people, whatever. Staten Island, we have less than a million people. We have, we have like 700,000 people. It's not like the rest of the city. Like, we don't have skyscrapers and you don't, you don't think of that urban decay that you see in the movies. Right. Like we got houses, trees, backyards. There are deer that run around here. It's very green. It's, it's spread out. Um, but, you know, a lot of our people that we have here commuted to Brooklyn, commuted to Manhattan every single day, and then they're coming back. Right. just around all of those people and Staten Island has a lot of doctors and police officers and teachers as well so we just have a ton of people that are still even though we're all spaced out and not on top of each other like the city we're in we've interacted with all those people right um, so now as more testing's happening it's, it's like 300 400 people every day it's like being added to that list and I think it's like one out of every 150 Staten Islanders has come down with it Wow. Uh, ratio, that's actually the largest ratio in New York City. Even though we have the least numbers as far as people who got it, our ratio is the biggest. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy. So right now, <clears throat> your kids are little. little. Um, and did you see, do you guys have a, a backyard where you're at or no? Yeah, yeah, I have a backyard. So you guys get to go outside in the backyard a little bit or do you not or do you stay inside? Yeah, but it's been really cold and rainy. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's been really cold and rainy, like, this last week. The weather hasn't been great. Um, so, unfortunately, we've only been, like, over the last two weeks, we've only really been able to go outside with the kids, like, two times. Um, so, that kind of stinks. I think this weekend it's supposed to be nice. We took a family outing to the supermarket last week, and they stayed in the car, and I ran in. That was, like, our trip out. It's like, all, all right, right, we're all going to go out. But they stayed in the car, and then, of course, Dad has to go and you know, fist fight the germs. Um, so <laughs> you got to go hunt together. <laughs> yeah, I hunted. Yeah, I mean, we're all like stocked up. We're good and stuff now, so I don't really have to run out as much. But um, but yeah. So we're trying to. Keep, I was like, oh man, we needed. We didn't have any like like jungle gym or anything in the backyard because literally where we live, there's like a park this way, a park that way, a park that way, a park that way. There's there's like five or six parks right around my house with swings, jungle gyms, and everything. Now we can't go to any of them. So I was like, all right, we might, I don't know how long this thing's going to last, but we might, you Best know, order one to set it up in the backyard so my daughter can play. Um, um, I feel you. You know, have a slide and stuff. But uh, yeah. We we ended up purchasing a trampoline. My wife got one last, order, ordered one last week and it's supposed to be here, I think, sometime this week or early next week. So we're just like, I get it, man. We got to, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, what's funny is we have a trampoline for my daughter, but it's at my parents' house, and they're quarantined right now. And they're actually in, I was telling you, you're in Idaho. My sister lives in Montana. Right. My sister just had a baby. So my parents flew out to Montana to be with my sister for six weeks. And literally two days after they got there is like when all this like shutdown happened. So like my parents are quarantined in Montana, Montana with my sister. So we don't even know when they can get back. Like how they can get, and they live in New Jersey, which okay. um, from Staten Island is literally like one exit away, um, and they they live about an hour away um, in total. But like, yeah, we we don't even know when my parents can get back. So 
I, I, I joked with them though, like if you guys can't get back and like we run out of toilet paper and stuff, like I'm driving to your house and I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just gonna raid raid all your toilet paper. I'll, I'll take the trampoline and, and anything else I need. I was like, you guys are stuck in Montana for God knows how long. <laughs> You're not gonna use it. <laughs> My mom was great. She was like, yeah, you, you go today if you want. If you guys wanna go away for the weekend, like a little vacation, go stay in our house. I was like, yeah exactly what we're going to do just go from one uh, quarantine to another quarantine another situation <laughs> that might actually be a good idea just for like a weekend or something you know yeah i guess it, it depends unless we infect their house and then right you know, yeah never we mind. could have it <laughs> and just have no symptoms and then my parents get back to a sick house <laughs> right, just house kidding on sick. that <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy man so in this time also like how have you what are you doing as far as in your in your in your own personal faith walk what are you doing to make sure you're staying, you know, connected. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I guess just being connected with, with family and kind of like staying in tune with what's happening in church. Like, like I, I want to say like, literally, like I said before, not much has changed except we're not going outside. So like we're still watching our church on Sundays. My pastor and his family are just doing church by themselves, you know, you know, the worship team and everything's happening and it's just them filming it on the phone and then we all get to watch it, uh, which is cool. And, you know, they, they do the prayer meetings during the week, but on the phone um, and just, yeah, I mean, we're just trying to stay normal, uh, you know, do the little Bible devotional stuff with my daughter. And we, we learned about Joseph this week and we made a coat of many colors. <laughs> that was, oh, nice. that was her craft. Um, but yeah, like just, I think that's also part of like the whole Corona thing too, even when it comes to, to faith walk, to whatever you're doing in work, whatever you're doing in life, just trying to keep everything as normal as possible. Because when you start changing things or like, if you get into this, this mode of like panic where you're just like, you're almost like stressing to God because you're just so worried about what's happening. That's just not healthy. Like that's going to make things worse. If you're just saying there, Oh God, you know, you have to save the world now and, and blah, blah, blah. And you're doing that all day and you're just worrying about getting sick. And when is the world going to get back to normal? And, you know, some people feel like, oh, we need to do that because this is the time uh, when we should be doing that. But I feel like that's a little counterproductive because you may have should have been doing that stuff beforehand anyway. And now that you're doing it and you're doing it to like this exceeding amount you're really just stressing yourself out. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess that's how that's how I feel with that. No, I get that completely because it, it, it almost feels like the focus of it becomes a lot more important than our relationship with the father as well as with our family. We're just so caught up in like, we need to pray for this, that, and the other. And I think we do, but at the same time as we can't, like you just said, we can't be so focused, hyper-focused on like- Can't be consumed on it yeah exactly um it's like it's like they say that when they use you they say like there's no there's no atheist in a foxhole like mm. you're sort of you're sort of on your everybody calls out to god like you know on their deathbed or their you know when they really need something the most right. and it's like well you should have been there already you know right, right it shouldn't have taken a global pandemic for you to be like you know what i think i, I need to get my faith life in order um you know, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how I feel about it. Nice, nice. So with, uh, I guess a question I would want to ask, what do you think is going to happen specifically within CHH? And I mean, I, I think maybe even just in general and like, uh, in the music industry. Um, so a part of me, I just kind of been thinking like forward on this thing, right? Like, it's got it's got to pass some point right i mean who knows how long we're going to be in this mm -hmm. situation but it's going to pass so with that with technology and just like within the arena that we're in in today like with artists specifically a lot of artists can have home studio set up right a lot of them already do yeah right right um so with that in mind like i almost feel like it's going to be after this passes a renaissance of music of artists coming out and just like releasing flooding the airwaves with all sorts of things and even like even in this time like i feel like because technology like we can as artists we can put more stuff out and try to get it out to people to you know hopefully encourage or just help them escape for a minute 
Um, right. What do yeah. you th- What do you think yeah, about? I all mean, that? I mean, in, as a world, I think we're we're the most equipped we've ever been to uh, at least creatively survive what's going on. Like, I'm not. I'm assuming you're around my age, like over thirty. Right. So, like, even think about fifteen years ago, mm-hmm. like when MySpace was just around, and or even before that. Like, if something happened then, like we didn't have like smartphones to, to do stuff like this, you know, even nothing was even in HD 15 years ago. So like we think 15 years ago, that's not that long ago. And we had like internet and technology, but if something like this had happened then, like we'd all be screwed pretty much. And, and the music industry would kind of come to a standstill. But right now, the only thing that's come to a standstill is concerts, um, which, you know, it's definitely a huge part and a huge part of artists making money, but you know, your music is still out there. It's not like you're depending on people to go to uh, a record store to go buy your CD to get paid because that doesn't exist anymore either. So you still have whatever income you were getting from your streams. Now it's just you creatively, uh, the artist trying to figure out ways to, I guess, stay relevant and stay within the, the eyes of your fans. Right. And I think you see that already. There's people doing live concerts, uh, you know, from their living room. There's, you know, people starting podcasts. There's people, um, you know, blogging. There's people vlogging. There's people doing things that they've never done before. And now they, they have like this time and this energy. Um, I'm sure that there's someone like hunkered away in a studio right now recording like six albums because it's like, wow, I don't, I don't have anything else to do. Let me go record all the music I have. So I think... <laughs> I think in like nine months, not only are you going to see a ton of babies from people. That's what I was thinking too. I was going to say that. You're going to see a ton of babies, a ton of divorces, <laughs> and a ton of new music. That you're, you're going to see. You're going to see in nine months. You're going to see horribly awesome. <laughs> yeah, you're going to see people uh, creating life, ending a life journey, and then uh, creating creating tons of music. I think uh, like definitely they're they're going to take a hit financially right now. Mm-hmm. But um, the amount of work and creativity and, and, and the things that they're using that nece- uh, necessitates their survival uh, right now, um, you're going to see like amazing things whenever this thing is over officially. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty like optimistic that that things will be even better, you know, on the other side of this. That makes sense. So... We talked about earlier earlier on um, your rap career. Tell me about that. Are you still rapping? Uh, I wouldn't say it's a career, um, but yeah. Um, <laughs> since uh, since I was about thirteen years old, I mean, I've always been into music. Uh, when I was about thirteen years old, I got a drum set uh, for graduating eighth grade. That was my present. So. All through high school, I was like a drummer in like punk bands, rock bands. I played for youth group. Um, And then sometime in like 2007, um, I was I was a drummer in my band and my my bass player and singer, uh, co-writer of everything that basically I've ever done, started like getting really, really good at making music. And I was not like really, really good at playing the drums. So I was like, I am good at writing and, and, you know, doing stuff. So I moved out from behind the drum set really. And I started rapping a little bit of singing and songwriting. And then we kind of formed a band around there. And it was a rap rock band uh, called process of fusion. Um, And at one point in Staten Island in around 2009, 2010, we were among the biggest bands um, on Staten Island. We, we were playing two or three shows a week sometimes um all, all over Staten Island or Brooklyn, uh sometimes New Jersey. Uh we almost got onto a couple uh we've almost won every single battle of the bands we've done and had some like real cool opportunities to get on festivals and stuff like that. Nice. Um so yeah that was always me like I was uh predominantly rapping in that group in that band. Um and then I started dabbling in stuff like on the side and I, I got hooked up with the studio and I was, I was also making uh, rap songs almost every single day uh, on my Mac computer. Like I got a MacBook with GarageBand when I was like 19 
And like, that was it. It was like, yo, we're getting a song a day. I'm making beats. I'm doing all this. And it was, it was garbage. I didn't even have a microphone. I was like rapping into the computer, you know, microphone. Um, uh, yeah, those songs are somewhere like on MySpace or SoundClick, if you remember SoundClick. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, terrible. Uh, so then I, I got into the studio and, I, you know, I, I started a label at some point. When wait, I was wait, uploading. wait, What was your rap name? My rap name was Sick Boy, S-I-K-B-O-I, because my youth pastor uh, thought I was crazy. And he was like, you're really a sick boy. And I was like, that's my name. Terrible <laughs> name. Terrible name. Uh, so, so, um, I love how a youth pastor gave it to you too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I did like a bat. We were like in a hotel, like at some sort of youth convention and I like kick flipped off a wall. Like I did a backflip off a wall and like elbow drop someone onto the bed. He's like, you're a sick boy. And I was like, okay. So then he, he used to just call me sick boy. So I was like, oh, that's my rap name. That's, that's going to be it. So I did not steal it from uh, childish Gambino who I think his first album was called sick boy. I had no idea. Uh, all these years later, all these years later, I found out. Um, so yeah, that was my rap name. I started my rap label. We did a couple of songs. Uh, we did a music. We did some music videos. I was in like a rap collective, uh, and then that kind of just went away, kind of like fizzled out. And you know, I focused more on my band. Now, all these years later, my band has fizzled out, and I have like two albums worth of. Uh, rap songs that I've written actually since I've been laid off from from <laughs> from that other job briefcast and like beats and stuff that I've made and it's actually like really good stuff or I, I think it's like really good it's my best stuff um and it's like a concept like a concept album so I've really just been sitting on it it's all written the beats are all made so finally like this year I've kind of gotten back uh, over the last six months gotten really back into music uh I dropped an Old Town Road Staten Island remix with my friend uh, last year that actually like 30,000 people listened to it. Oh, wow. Uh, and like really received well. Uh, so I was like, wow, this is the most successful thing I've ever done was doing an Old Town Road Lil Nas X remix uh, for Staten Island as far as music. Um, then we were working on another song. We had a cool writing opportunity to write for somebody also that we did a hip hop song. Um, so now I'm finally like in, or I was before all this happened, was taking steps to like record a single and, and kind of like come back um, into music. And oh, nice. I feel like, yeah, I feel like my, my ship sailed because I spent my whole 20s trying to do music. And I was like, when I hit 30, I was like, it didn't work. So let's do this now. But now ah, I just love music. So why not? I'm not trying to make it, I have a career. So you know, I'm not trying to make a hip hop career, but if I can put out some music that I've just been sitting on to make me happy, and then someone's like, hey, that was really dope. Like, I think I would I would feel accomplished that I did it, did it. You know, I've, I've been doing some sort of music since I'm 12 years old or 13 years old and I'm 31. So I've just always, I've, I'm still playing shows with my, I, my band. We played, we really kind of fizzled out last year, but even last year we played two or three shows. So I haven't played a show in in, in like almost a year. Mm -hmm. um, we were in the studio for a couple of years, like making our album, uh, which is another thing. We have an album of 14 tracks that we spent four years recording and it never came out. Oh, geez. So maybe at some point this year, that'll come out too. And then I'll just have like so much music out after like all this time. Like, where have you been? It was like, well, I've, I've just been sitting on like 40 songs for the last five years <laughs> or whatever it's been. And they'll all just come out at once. Um, but yeah, like that stuff with my band is the best stuff we've ever done and recorded. And the stuff that I'm sitting on is the best stuff that I've ever written. Mm -hmm. uh, I just need to record it. So, and I'm not going to be sick boy anymore. I think uh, <laughs> I'm just going to go, I'm just going to go with my, like my initials are JMS. So I think I'm just going to go with like, almost like the Eminem way of how you pronounce JMS, like JMS, J-A-Y-E-M-E-S. I think that's what I'm going to go with. Okay. Um, but who knows? I don't know. Are, Justin are, Sarachik doesn't feel like, yo, listen to this rapper, Justin Sarachik, that doesn't do anything for me. Uh, so <laughs> it might just be like J J M S or something like that. Uh, okay. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe somebody will dub you with a name, a new name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm too, I think I'm too old to try to find a rat name right now. So 
I was just going to put that music out and see and see what happens. Oh, that's awesome. Are you going to put it, is it going to be like all over everything? Like on Spotify and stuff, you think? Yeah, I mean, that's that would be the plan. And then I guess I'll see what the reception's like. And if it's like, nope, you should have held on to these, then I know. And then I was like, okay, this wasn't it. But if people are like, oh, this is good. Then I know in my brain, I'm like, oh, I could do this. I could do this. Let's let's do it. And then, and then I'm going to go way too hard into it. So I need like a happy medium where it's like, you know, that was pretty good. We respect it. But like, don't, don't quit your day job sort of deal. Like I need, I need Which, somewhere in the middle. What you need to do is you need to post it to your guys as to Rob Zill is uh, that guy who listens to the submissions. Oh, OB. On but do music. it, but do it anonymous. Like do it as some other guy's name and just post it up. Cause then he'll be honest. Cause he won't be, he'll be like, Oh, I know this guy. I don't, you, you guys know each other probably. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah so you don't want to, none of that. Cause you don't want no, like, you don't want that favoritism from your home, from your boy. No, no, he wouldn't. <laughs> I, I know he probably hit me on the side though. He'd be like, bro, this isn't it, man. This isn't it. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm feeling confident that like, this is it for me. At least nice. it's the best that I can do. Right. <laughs> so um, I think it's pretty good. I definitely, I definitely think the concepts, the concept that I, that I came up with, um, I guess I'll just share it with you. So, cause, cause it's faith relevant. Um, so it's two EPs and I'm going to, I think I'm just going to put them together now. Um, but it's basically called the skeptic and the believer. Mm. Um, and I actually had this concept for my band and I wanted these songs to be for my band, but that went away. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to do it myself. Um, so it's like one half of the EP is, is kind of just like, that's the skeptic part where it's, mm. it talks about somebody who's lost their faith or losing your faith. And, you know, personally to me, it's like, it's all those doubts that you have, like, this isn't real, this isn't whatever. And then the believer half of it is kind of like, these are all the reasons why you continue to believe or you still do, or that you've come out of that skeptical part. And then I might like just do one extra song that kind of ties the two together, like kind of like as a journey. Um, but yeah, it's called the skeptic and the believer. That's cool. Um, man. So that, that would be it. So hopefully at least if the raps aren't good or you don't enjoy the music, at least the concept was pretty cool. <laughs> but we'll, but we'll see. I need to, I need to drop that song first. I have, I definitely have another um, single that was supposed to be dropping with a co with a friend of mine. That's unrelated to that. Um, and that song is really dope. Uh, but we were supposed to record it. Uh, and then he got sick and then we're like, all right, we'll just record it next week. And then the coronavirus happened. Oh, geez. So otherwise, I would have had this song already. And I would have already known if I should even be talking about my music. <laughs> so, so before all this went down, were you trying to record at the Phoenix studio then? Or where were you guys recording that? No, I actually wasn't recording there. Uh, my friend has his own home studio. Um, and, you know, at Phoenix Studios, I would have to pay. And he's like, well, if we write the song together, we'll just record it at my house for free. And I was like, yes, <laughs> let's do that. And he has a good, he has a good setup, you know, in his house and good mic and, uh, you know, like a side room and, you know, he's, and he's a really good engineer himself. So, you know, he sung the hook and then we kind of, um, he came up with a, with a piano part and then we kind of built the beat together. And then I went home and I wrote the raps for it. And then, um, you know, he was going to sing the hook and I, all I had to do was literally just go and lay down my verses and he nice. got sick oh. and then this all happened. So now yeah, I'm just yeah. like, ah, so now I'm just sitting on this song, but, uh, you know, it's time to practice or like maybe rework it and get it the best it possibly can. So whenever we can do it, we'll, we'll do it. There you go. Um, <clears throat> so dabbling, you're talking about dabbling in a few things. We're going to kind of go off of that topic dabbling. Um, so you dabble in beats then a little bit or? Yeah, I mean, if if people would consider like things I come up with with loops and stuff on GarageBand, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's beat making. I think some of some of them come out cool. Some of them it's like, all right, it's it's all right. But um, I think I I figured out like ways to kind of make loops um, cool and transformative in a way that like it's not. I'm not just grabbing and, and pasting things. Yeah. From the from the archive of GarageBand, like I'm actually transforming, you know, some of it and changing the pitches and 
major minor keys and things like that. So I'd like to think like my beats actually sound pretty cool. Um, but again, I'm really just been doing all this stuff by myself without any outside influence. So, so to me, like these things sound great. Um, but you know, I get hundreds and hundreds of emails every week at Rabzilla of music that I need mm -hmm. to listen to. And some of it is straight trash. Right. Some of it I'm like, okay, my beats are, are definitely better than this guy's beats or my raps are definitely better than this guy's raps. And this person's submitting it and they're trying to actually be a rapper. So, so I get some confidence in hearing what other people's bad Yeah, so you kind of have a sounding board. Right, right. Yeah, I, I definitely know what sounds good. I definitely know what sounds bad. Um, so I think I'm somewhere in the middle. Nice. I'm like, I think I'm just like average. <laughs> <laughs> I, could be your, I could be your rap name, Average Joe. Average, average J. Average J. There you go. Average J. I'll think about it. That's not bad. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's funny about the, yeah, I always thought that anyways, like, just like, I don't know if I could do that. Cause like, it would be, you guys get so many submissions coming into you guys coming. It's just like, Oh my God, I know I've submitted two before and I'm not trying to, but it's just like, it's like, dang, they hear this stuff all the time. So like, how do you like, as an artist, what would be a tip you would give to an artist that like, be like, how can you submit and make sure that you're submitting? Obviously you want to do your best foot forward, yeah. but like, what do you think? What's, what's a good tip for people submitting to you guys? This is my favorite subject. I could talk about this all day. All right. um, so the first thing you need to do is actually just follow the directions of submission. So like when you go to contact Rabzilla, we have a whole submission page and it literally tells you exactly how to, to submit. And I've heard not. you. I've heard you say this before. Believe it or not, but you go ahead. All the time, I say it all the time, and I say it on, and I put all my artist tips on Twitter. And I don't know if you follow me on Twitter, uh, but I do my artist tips like every other day, like, and they're all based on like awful submissions that I see. And then I kind of like make it funny, and I put it like as an artist tip, like maybe don't don't use your family photo for Christmas as your album artwork. And, you may think that this is self-explanatory, but I just saw it. Like, that's my artist tip of the day. Like, and I'll do stuff like that. Oh my God. And, and that all of them are based on like some realm of truth. I tell like 9.8% of the truth in my artist tip. I, I, I leave out that little tiny last bit just to kind of make it funny and embellish it a little bit, <laughs> but it drives home the point. Um, but uh, yeah, like go to the submission page. We tell you exactly what we need. And if you miss one of those things, it's like, it, like, and, and I tend to get suckered in and listen to these emails anyway, but there's some of them that come in that's just so bare bones or terribly submitted. It could be the next Jay-Z. I'm not pressing it because it's just, there, there was no effort. Like you want people to put in effort and write about you, right? And, and put in time to critique your music and, and, use my time that I don't have much of to put you on a website, but you can't even take the time to like address an email properly or even put a subject line in the email. There's people who drop links in the subject line of the email. You can't, you can't click a subject line of the email or, or be like, yo, sup, peep this. And then they drop a song <laughs> or they, or they'll be like, Hey, can you upload my new music video? But then they don't even put the music video in there. No link or anything. <laughs> yeah. Or, or sometimes I get like, I'll throw a great word out. I'll, I get bamboozled. I get the most amazing, professional, well-crafted email. They must have took uh, hours to put this together. It's incredible. I'm like, wow, this person's got management. They got a team. Like, let's go. I'm excited. And I press click and it is hot garbage. And I'm like, oh, no. I was like, what are you doing? What, what happens? What went, who, what sort of American Idol situation was this when your parents were like, yeah, 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 go, go for it. We'll support you. And then the judges are like, why are you here? Like sometimes that person was supposed to be a manager, not an artist. <laughs> right. That person's, you know, mom was telling them that they sounded really good, but that was it. Like they only had their mom telling them that they sounded good and chase your dreams. Uh, so yeah, that, that ranges the spectrum. But my number one thing is like, be professional. Like think of um, sending an email to a publication and a press, like a press release. Think of that as a resume for a job. Mm -hmm. You want to send, send in your resume in the most professional way so that when a job is looking to hire you, everything's there and they're like, oh wow, you know, this person knows their stuff. They're professional, they're organized. 
they look put together. Even if you're not put together, you know, perception, just look put together. So think of that press release as your same thing. That's your resume for you as an artist. This is the first thing I'm going to see when I open that email. Your artist name, your all of your links are correct. People send links that don't work. Like, you know, here's my Facebook page and you click it and it's a dead link. And you're like, Whoa, what are you doing? Like, just literally go through your email, click everything, make sure it works. Make sure your name is spelled right. I've seen people misspell their own name or that your name is consistent, which, you know, it's not capital here, all caps there, lowercase there, uh, your name plus music there. It's like, where's your branding? You have no consistency. I don't know what your name, if I can't figure out what your name is, then I'm not posting you, even if you sound good. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, and it really, it all, all it takes is just effort. Like right. all I want to see is an effort, like just represent yourself well. Um, and that's my, that's my biggest, um, I guess that's my biggest pet peeve. Just like people who just don't put any effort into their, their craft, into what they're trying to do. And that's what I would say is my biggest, the biggest way to get into the good graces of my heart. When you submit your music is to at least look like you know what you're doing your music's a different story i can't control what you create but <laughs> but if you if you package it nicely enough you may be able to fool me um into at least giving you a shot <laughs> that's awesome thanks for sharing all that it's good yeah. that's valuable information so along the lines of dabbling what are some of the uh and we'll kind of we'll, we'll kind of come to a wrap up here shortly um what are what are some of the uh things that you entrepreneur that you are currently doing? Okay, so let's see. So I got my Rapzilla thing. I, I do a bunch of other freelance stuff on the sides, but like stuff that I would say is is particularly like me of my creation. Um, I have my Survival of the Artist podcast uh, where I talk to successful creatives within uh, the music space on, on just that. Like, how have you been able to survive? Um, what have you done? And most of the people I speak to are independent artists who ha have achieved success on their own. So, you know, I've had uh, No Big Deal, uh, Mowgli the Iceberg. I've had uh, Davis Absolute. Um, I'm going to have Fern next week. I've had Jared Sanders. Um, if you've heard of the battle rapper and viral rapper, Mac Lethal, um, I've had him. He's probably one of the largest uh, people I've ever had. Uh, I've had Tim Trudeau, who's the owner of Syntax Creative, which is marketing and distribution. And all these people have like a unique perspective on, you know, what they've done and, and how they've gotten there. Um, and everyone has a, a great perspective of, of that. And everyone has a different story. And I have my experiences too. You know, I've, I've made music, I've done music. And I've also covered and written about music. And then I've, I've done like the artist management side or the, the press side. So like I have like that, that, that 360 view of, of music from, from creating it all the way to writing about it. So I definitely have a lot of value uh, that I can impart too. So it's just kind of extracting these important conversations with artists. So I have that survival of the artist podcast. And then I'm taking the artist tips that I drop on Twitter and I'm writing a book and it's going to be like survival of the artist, you know, tips on how to succeed. I don't have like the name set in stone yet, but it's going to be survival of the artist of the book. Uh, and then it's going to have all of my hundreds of artist tips. And I'm literally taking my artist tips that I've tweeted out for the last five years. And I'm putting them as like little um, sections of the book and I'm expounding upon them. So like that example, like hashtag artist tip, don't use your family Christmas photo as, as your artwork, you know, for your headshot or whatever. Right, right. And then I'll write like, you know, a paragraph or two, just kind of expanding upon that. Like, this is the artwork you should be using. This is, you know, get a professional photo, a high res photo, learn how to resize your photo, you know, use, you know, this and that. And I'll just go down the line about submitting music, um, you know, um, recording, um, streaming, you know, etiquette, artist etiquette, all that. Uh, so that book is probably a little over halfway done. Um, again, I thought I was like, oh, we're quarantined. I'll have more time to write about this. No, because now I have less time. Um, so, 
most people have more time. I have less time because then the other half the time I'm just exhausted. So, so that book is kind of slowed down. So dad those are, life. Yeah, life. So I yeah, said dad uh, life. <laughs> dad, hash, hashtag dad life. Yeah. Um, that's that's my next book. Oh, actually, that, that reminds me. So another thing I started. I really love food. Super passionate about food. I've like always wanted to own a restaurant or be involved in a restaurant. I've worked in restaurants in the past. I've booked. I book shows at restaurants um, on Staten Island sometimes. Um, I've watched every food show probably on Netflix that exists and YouTube. Uh, so I created a page called Plated by Dads. And it's all, um, you know, stuff that I make. But then I also want submissions from other dads because dads get a bad rap uh, for like being terrible in the kitchen or a lot of be submitting. Guys. Yeah, you chef it up. You're good. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. So I want you to submit because I know there's a lot of dads who, I mean, it's like yes, definitely stay out of the kitchen. Like this is your wife's thing. But I'm not one of those people, and I do most of the cooking because I've been at home, mm -hmm. um, and my wife would come home from work, and I was like, well, I don't want to eat at like seven o'clock or eight o'clock. I want to eat like now. I'm starving now. So I started cooking, and even when I worked in the city. Um, in Manhattan, I would still get home first. So I would get home first and now I'm already home. So I'm always cooking and uh, I've watched all these shows. I've, I've like really learned and like got a, a passion for cooking. So I was like, you know what? I want dads who can chef it up to get their due. So I made it plated by dad. So like basically I'll, I'll post every other post is like me. And then the next post will be like a submission from someone like you or, or whoever. Um, and the page, I mean, it's still pretty new. Like, I think I have like 80 followers and it's, it's been up for like three weeks, but uh, I'm going to start pushing it a little more. Um, but yeah, it's, it's cool just to see dads uh, throw down. Um, so I have that. That's my new, that's my new project to see what happens. With that. Uh, so I got the podcast, the book that uh, I'm going to start doing my artist tips. I'm going to start doing them as a video and I'm just going to record like little probably like one minute videos for Instagram uh, that just gives you like an artist tip of the week mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, so that just keeps with that whole survival of the artist, artist tip type brand. So I'm really like kind of pushing, pushing that sort of branding. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's it for my entrepreneurial stuff. Like I'm always kind of like thinking of, of ways and, and kind of like sticking my nose into places where I feel like, Hey, I think I have some good ideas for this. If you would have me, can we do this? Um, so I'm kind of always on the lookout for stuff. Oh, okay. I got one more thing. Um, I recently got involved with this uh, Instagram page called Crime Faces, um, who right now their content is very like world star kind of ratchet stuff. Right. But they are looking to actually make serious things and go from that that ratchet like world star type fighting uh, reaction videos to creating serious like crime dramas and like tell crime stories um mm. like stuff you would see on netflix like mickey Minner or you know central park five and the aaron hernandez you know like stuff like that um so we actually got together um and they brought me on board as kind of a writer and i'm helping them and i've written the the treatment of their first uh, foray into a, a documentary uh, about this man named Mario Machete, who uh, was arrested in 1986 for a murder that he didn't commit. And he wound up staying in jail until I believe it was 2010. So from 1986 to 2010. And uh, he's never been like acquitted or anything. He's always maintained his innocence. Um, he His trial, if you go back and you like, because anyone can just be like, yeah, Anyone, everyone in prison is innocent, right? You know, so, but if you like actually look at his trial and you see the circumstances and you, you speak to people that knew him and the, the sort of weird situation around the whole thing, and it's like pretty evident that he got a raw deal. Um, minority from, from Brooklyn in the 80s during the crack epidemic and kind of like, well, we got no one else to blame uh, for this. Uh, but this guy looks like, it's probably him. So he kind of got one of those deals where it was like, there was no evidence, but they're like, we'll, we'll choose him sort of deal. And people ratted him out 
well, not read it. Well, read him out would imply that he did it, but you know, people lied about what they saw or whatever. So we kind of want to tell his story for the first time. And he's like kind of what they would call like in New York City, he's like a hood legend. Like all the gangs know about him, all the prisons know about him. Everybody loves this guy. Everybody like vouches for him. Um, so I had the opportunity to sit with him and interview him and kind of write out his whole story. And again, there was something we were set to film over the next month or so. And then this whole thing happened. Uh, but we were going to film this documentary and then try to sell it to like a Netflix or, you know, Amazon Prime, Hulu, whatever, HBO. We were just going to pitch it and we've made some connections to actually do so. Um, and we know people that are interested in Mario's story because they've met him and they've heard his story firsthand and they're just waiting. They're like, we're, we've been waiting for this story for years. That's so we're amazing. finally ready to tell it and now we can't. Um, so that's, that's kind of my next kind of foray into that. I would love to do more film uh, stuff and, and writing and, you know, it's a new way to tell stories for me. Like that's not typing. And uh, I was telling Fern on his podcast earlier today, like it really sucks when you pour your heart out and like, I just did this two hour interview with someone and I wrote like 2000 words and it's the best article I've ever written in my life. And then like a hundred people read it or like people, see the headline and like oh this sucks and they don't even read it and it's like yo but i i put all this effort right. but they'll sit and watch like 300 hours of a show so but they can't take six minutes to read an article or 10 minutes to read an article so i'm kind of tired of just uh putting my best self out in writing and getting nothing to show for it and i was like all right at least we can put it on film somebody will watch it um so that's that's kind of the next step so that i guess that's my entrepreneurial journey uh, that involves food, food, film, and helping artists, which is like my top, my top three things that I enjoy, except, uh, my next move would be baseball. Got to figure out how to get involved, uh, writing for baseball somehow. Nice. Uh, and then, and then I've run the gamut of passions and then I could retire a broke writer probably, but nevertheless, sorry. <laughs> $10 an article, $10 an article, $10 an article. <laughs> All right. So, uh, we're going to kind of wrap up here, but, uh, wanted to kind of get from you, uh, just, just a word of encouragement for people out there that are watching this, um, during this time, what would you, how would you encourage somebody right now? Somebody who's going through it or just somebody who's super focused on what's going on. And yeah, uh, you know, I would say, so first of all, if you're healthy and you're at home and you're watching this and you're down and upset, the first thing that you can hang your head on is exactly that you're healthy and you're home. You're not in a hospital and you're not sick. So you're already doing better than most people, right? So have that encouragement. Like, I don't know what your job situation may be or, you know, whatever chaos is around you, but you're blessed if you if you have a home to be in and you're healthy. Um, so just ride this thing out, do everything that you can to not become unhealthy. And eventually this world is going to get back to normal and then you can go on to, you know, be your best self. And for anyone who's watching this that is sick or, you know, you know, really in danger of, you know, not having enough money or resources. Um, I've seen a lot of people in communities through this kind of like come together and take care of people even without touching them physically, mm -hmm. uh, which is, which is crazy. I know there's tons of local, uh, at least where I'm at, tons of local restaurants that are giving food out to first responders or for families who need it. Um, there, there's going to be somebody that could help you and like, don't be afraid to reach out because obviously this is unprecedented times. It's a pandemic. We're all going through this for the first time together. The world doesn't know what to do. Um, so everybody just has to kind of work together, stay together, stay, stay prayed up, stay, stay, uh, stay clean, stay stocked up on everything that you need and uh yeah keep don't be afraid to share that toilet paper either for somebody for somebody who needs it oh especially, that's real that's real especially if you hoarded it up but I, i've also seen people doing that too like for for the mailmen people putting out hand sanitizer or boxes of tissues or uh snacks or whatever just for the people that have to still show up to your house every day or take your garbage or do your mail like you you, you don't realize the people that you take for granted, like 
just the person that comes and collects your garbage. Just imagine if like the garbage men have to stay home during this pandemic. Like what are you doing with your garbage? You're just piling it up in front of your house. Um, so like if you don't have any of these jobs and just know that there's still people out there that are servicing you, even though you're stuck at home. Um, so always try to find like the bright side. Like I, just to repeat what I said before, like I'm at home with my family. We're all working. We're all healthy. So I can't complain about anything except that it's a little inconvenient that I'm more tired than usual, but we're all, we're all tired <laughs> of something. So yeah, that would be my word of encouragement. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So before we get off, I just want to have you just, can you plug uh, whatever you want to plug, plug everything that you want to plug? Cause I'm going to, at the end of this, I'm going to throw up the, uh, during the video, I'm going to throw up all your tags. So. Oh, okay. All right. So you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Justin Sarachik. And I will spell that. Uh, so J U S T I N. That's my first name. And then S A R A C H I K. And it's all one. So at Justin Sarachik. Um, Instagram, you'll see a lot of like food stuff and funny things that my kids do. Twitter, if you want to like really follow my artist tips and music industry stuff. Um, or speak to me about working with me or, or whatever, like that's the place you need to go. And Facebook is just kind of dead. You can just give me the follow there just for funsies. Uh, <laughs> then on Instagram, if you're a dad who chefs it up and, and you want that recognition that you deserve as a dad, or if you're a dad who actually cooks horribly and you think that it would be really funny for other people to laugh at, like you're really burnt like pizza or whatever it is, I would love to take that too. So you can follow me at Plated by Dads on Instagram. Um, other than that, uh, Survival of the Artist podcast, you can look that up on SoundCloud. Um, and that's it. Rap, uh, rapzilla.com, you can see all my articles, um, Rapzilla everywhere. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's all, the, that's all the plugs I got. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Justin. That was awesome. Thank you for taking your time out and uh, sharing with me, this complete stranger. <laughs> I appreciate it big time, man. Keep doing what you're doing. And I'm looking forward to hearing your music as well as just continue doing what you've been doing with Rapzilla and everything else you got your hand in. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really, I really love doing like this, uh, doing things like this. It's, it's cool to be on the other side of an interview every once in a while. So like for every like 500 interviews, I, I, do to someone else i'll get like one back for me so this is my second one of the day so now my ratio is going down a lot so i feel i feel like well people want to talk to me about stuff so this is cool uh and i do have a lot to say about things so uh, i really and i love talking about like important things like this so yeah man it was a pleasure i, I can't wait to uh hear this and uh you know i look forward to see who else you get on the show because it'll probably be some friends of mine people that i know nice Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Read the submission guideline. <laughs> that's, that's, my last, that's my last thing for you, to, for you to hear. Corona season, episode three with Justin out in New York. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah.